Good morning and welcome to our fireside chat this morning with my colleagues Don Hauser and Stuart Burns. This one's going to be a little bit different, no slides, so you can just kind of listen to the to the dialogue in the background. We're going to talk about falling demand, rising prices and supply chain shocks. And I thought it would be a little bit more fun if some of us share some of our personal nightmares and stories. Um, I think after trading metals for the better part of 20 years and in this industry, there's a lot of stories to share. Um, I wanna encourage everybody to go ahead and put your questions in the LinkedIn chat. We love that, we love to hear from you. So if you wouldn't mind, just throw in the chat, where are you calling from or where are you listening um, to this webinar from? Um, and if you've got any fun stories or anything, and we'd love to, you know, feel free to drop us a line on that as well. Um, and with that, there's not really too much from a housekeeping perspective. We're just going to kind of hit things off with some kind of global events, things that are happening and some reactions. And then at the end, I certainly want to spend some time just to share with you some of the free resources that we have on the Metal Miner website. So with that, I'm going to kind of kick things off. Um, Don, I want to kick things off with you. There's been a lot of discussion recently about the UAW strike. Um, obviously, that is what we would call a supply chain shock. How do you think about events like that in terms of how it could affect, for example, steel prices? I think it could have a big impact on steel prices. I mean, the auto industry as a whole is a giant consumer. You've seen some of the other consumers kind of fall off on their demand already. So auto is really helping prop up an already following falling steel market. So if that shutdown if that strike goes long enough, I'm thinking five or six weeks, it'll have really big impacts on the, the economy as a whole, but steel prices for sure will get really soft really fast. Interesting. I'm going to quick flip. Stuart, do you have just some comments on how do you think it would impact like aluminum prices and copper prices and stuff like that? Same way or different? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> the auto industry is increasingly becoming a, 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 the most important. Uh, market for aluminum products, not necessarily in volume, but in terms of price leading is one of the highest margin markets for the aluminium producers. So I think it's going to <laughs> cause quite a bit of pain if if it uh, if it uh, progresses, as Don says, for sort of five or six weeks, it's, it's really going to impact um, yeah. prices. I was at a um, an event about a week ago and I asked and the, and the event was held in uh, central Michigan and I asked the audience to weigh in on it was probably the eve of the strike or two days before and asked how many of you think that the strike um, will happen I mean the entire room raised their hands so um, I think the supply chain is somewhat braced I know they've probably buffeted some stocks and in inventory by kind of pushing things through earlier. Don, how do you think, you know, we have upcoming steel contract negotiations um, for next year. How does a strike impact, like, how to think about that from a contract negotiation standpoint? Well, in the current market, I'm not sure it has a huge impact because I think the steel market was already soft and kind of in decline. So, you know, I'm kind of telling people, if you're looking for, for a fixed number, you should probably wait a little longer anyway. I think the strike and um, some of that demand getting pulled out or a lot of that demand potentially getting pulled out makes it even more important. I don't think I would you know, fix a contract now. If you're really waiting and negotiating off some sort of index and a discount or something like that, it's not really a huge impact either way. You know, you're just looking at you know, the number is going to be whatever the number is and you, you negotiate that way. Uh, I think a little later in the year, you will have a little more power with with the mills or service centers as the demand falls off. You might have a little more negotiating leverage going out. And then the other thing that I kind of talked about early was the broader economic impact of a mm. longer strike. So it, it, you have to look outside of just the auto industry because that net is so wide. It could really cause... A ripple effect and and really push us over into a recession kind of quickly in my opinion so it, you know your own demand might be different now versus a six eight ten week auto strike in whatever industry you are 
is those folks quit spending money on whatever it is that you you may produce. Good point. Good point. So when you think about contracting mechanisms, uh, do you have any thoughts on that for contract negotiations? And does and does that change based on the duration of the strike, for example? It does a little bit. You know, it kind of depends on what your overall risk tolerance is as a company. You know, some some companies do a fixed number, and they don't really care so much what the fixed number is. They want to know. I, I can set my price at the beginning of the year. I know what my cost of goods sold is. Maybe the number's good, maybe the number's not. Um, I think if you're kind of following an index going into to next year, uh, you could probably do pretty well that way too. I would probably stay away from any kind of scrap contract. You know, I talk a lot about scrap contracts as, a, as an alternative, but those really only work in a rising market. I definitely stay away from, from those, but as always, I think it's a it's important to have some sort of a, a fixed contract or an index contract or you know something that kind of spreads the risk around a little bit. And you have to kind of evaluate where you want to be as a company to decide on where that blend is. Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay, we're going to go for another shock and just uh, this time a little bit more global in nature and just kind of get some. Uh, feedback on that. So Stuart, I'm going to make up an, th this one's not made up. This is a potential one that I'm about to introduce. Obviously the one that just happened is the one that actually happened. Um, so that's, that shock would be um, a geopolitical issue, particularly uh, a potential invasion or some sort of blockade against Taiwan by China. What can companies do in advance or how do you think about shuffling your global supply mix in a scenario like that and if you could talk about maybe stainless or aluminum that would be great too mm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's 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 a very real possibility i mean the, the chinese have been saber rattling for months and months now about the situation in taiwan and as we were all debating internally last week it could it could as much be a blockade as an actual invasion and that puts everybody in a very difficult situation if China were to blockade Taiwan, to put them under pressure, to try and bring coercion to, to uh, some kind of settlement with mainland China, then there wouldn't be a shooting war, there wouldn't be a hot war. Uh, America wouldn't get involved, couldn't get involved in a situation like that, nor could anyone else in the West. But the impact on supply chains is going to be, would be, would be profound. Um, we have saw the situation when uh, Russia invaded uh, Ukraine, the West didn't get involved militarily, they used sanctions. And I think the same mechanisms would be used against China. Now, China is a much more important supplier to the West, to the world, sure. than, than Russia is. And yet, we're still suffering some of the consequences of Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine. Uh, people focus very much on the oil and the gas market, but the metals markets have been profoundly impacted as well. I was talking last week to an aerospace company, which has got inventory coming out of its ears at the moment. And I said, well, a lot of the supply chains got inventory. He said, oh, no, no. The reason for this is we're having trouble getting components. The components which are being made with titanium and, and Russia is a big producer of titanium. So when they need one component, they order five because they're not sure when they'll be able to get the second or third one. There's no just in time for these anymore. It's just in case they have inventory sitting on the shop floor. They've got it in there. The warehouses are full and, and they've got it in what they rather quaintly call their woodshed, which I mean, their, their, their packing dispatch department. Uh, but it's just an example, 18 months after the invasion of uh, Ukraine and the market is still suffering supply shocks, even sure. though prices have come off. And I think the same situation would happen out in Asia. Uh, so much of the materials we consume here in the West are coming from Southeast Asia, not just from China, but from Taiwan, from, uh, from Korea, from Japan. And those shipping lanes would be disrupted and internal uh, uh, intra-trade within S Southeast Asia, on which so many component suppliers rely, would be profoundly affected. So how do we think about it? Well, it's a tough one. Uh, we, In the case of the S aerospace company, they're carrying more inventory. But um, 
from my own experience, that's a terribly expensive thing to do in a time of high interest rates. So we have right. to look at alternative sources of supply, develop second sources of supply. So let me just touch back on a comment because I want to know if you have a different opinion. So in the case of the UAW, Don mentioned he thought like steel prices and some of those prices would come under pressure. What would you think would happen in a China, Taiwan and blockade or full outright invasion scenario with prices? Well, I, I think we'd see a massive impact on logistics for one thing. And what we saw during the pandemic was the prices rose dramatically. Um, as much as anything, they rose because logistics costs increased, uh, never mind the underlying metal prices. So I think shortage of a metal supply would push up costs. And even if the underlying, say, London Metal Exchange or, or CME prices didn't move as dramatically as we thought, the premiums that the mills charge for conversion would rise because we would be totally reliant on Western sources of supply rather than Asian sources of supply. So I think it would have quite an inflationary impact on prices. I would I would think so. And I know that, that that's kind of what happened with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, right? Prices kind of ran up yeah. and kind of held, you know, varying different metals, different things happened to it. Now, of course, the markets are, the demand, the softer demand scenario is kind of leading the, the narrative here. What else should suppliers, so what should suppliers be doing right now in the event of this type of event, particularly this logistics ones in, in Southeast Asia? What, what should people be, do, be doing or thinking about? Well, from my own experience, one of the issues that uh, we faced when Russia invaded uh, Ukraine was that we have a business here in the UK, I have a business here in the UK, which was 80, 90% of the product that it was selling, an aluminum product, was of Russian origin. It was, the business was dedicated really on its strength of its, of its core strength of its Russian supplier relationships. But we'd always held secondary sources of supply, uh, quality approved, as alternatives and fortunately we were able to switch sources of supply to India and to China uh, and keep the business going in fact flourish really in the last two years of high prices and high demand despite not having our regular Russian sources of supply so I think a secondary source of supply even a third source of supply is critical you don't necessarily have to be buying much material from them you just have to have them quality, quality approved you need to do your vetting and your approvals. You need to have your clients approve them as uh, quality, approve them as a source of supply so that they're sitting there in the background. Uh, all businesses should, for their core components anyway, have second and third sources of supply. But it becomes even more important when you're potentially faced with this kind of uh, global geopolitical risk. Right. I, I do think that's, that's, I think that's super important because it doesn't take a whole lot of money to get that done. I mean, you don't have to actually buy the material, but it does a couple of things. So it mitigates some of your risk, which is what Stuart was talking about. But it also gives you negotiation leverage too. Like a lot of times suppliers will know or feel strongly that you're sole sourced with them. And then it kind of takes away some of your negotiation leverage. If they know you're testing material and qualified material or parts, whatever it may be from other suppliers, it gives you a stronger negotiation point as well. It's kind of dual prong and it's the least out of all the resourcing activities, qualifying but not resourcing is probably the cheapest and the easiest. Good suggestion, good suggestion. It reminds me back um, when the Trump tariffs came out, uh, I had fielded a phone call from somebody who told me that they were uh, the sole supplier for a particular automotive line um, the material was sourced from Roussel, which of course was named in the, the Trump tariffs and the sanctions. Um, there was a, a one day, it wasn't one day, but there was a whole issue around sourcing the, those kinds of materials. And, you know, he kind of called distraught. Do we have any other suppliers or thoughts? And I said, go find your PPAP. Like it's somewhere in a file somewhere. Go look at that PPAP because <laughs> there must be probably another one or two different suppliers, you know, listed on that, that you could, you know, you could go back to. Um, I also wanted to kind of touch on the same topic, but maybe from a different perspective. So I've got a, a colleague that um, buys a lot of, sources a lot of material from China. 
it represents a pretty significant percentage of his total sales. And there seems to be a bit of a deer in the headlights kind of thought process happening right now with regard to China um, at the moment. So does your guidance change in any way? If you've got a lot of parts that you're sourcing from China right now, how do you think about that given sort of the geopolitical environment there? And I, I do think that that environment is deteriorating. It's not improving. Any other thoughts on if you've got like pretty significant operations already, you know, underway where you're importing pretty regularly? I know he's plans on buying up extra <laughs> to kind of buffer, but any thoughts on that? Either of you? Well, it's a real risk, and I think you've seen that already in the past, I don't know, 12, maybe 18 months. Companies have started bringing stuff closer, uh, even if it's not to the U.S. I, I talked a couple of weeks ago about companies like their material in a place where they can put it on a truck and still get it, you know. Um, you have those issues with the Panama Canal or the Suez Canal, or it's, you know, it's, it's always something it seems like these days. So I think that movement from China to somewhere closer is already started. Um, and it's, sure. it's underway. You see that with the fact that Mexico is now our biggest trade partner instead of China. So uh, if you haven't at least looked at that already, you are really late to the party, in my opinion. Yep, no, good points. Stuart, anything to add there? Um, <clears throat> well, I think only that um, uh, where, where labor costs are still a significant part of the uh, of the mix of the, say, a component price or so on, then if it's not China, it could be other parts of Southeast Asia, Indonesia maybe, or Vietnam, or even India is becoming an increasingly attractive proposition for many companies. And they're a big producer of many base metals. I mean, they're a big zinc and copper producer, a big aluminum producer, substantial steel producers, and it's, their capacity and capabilities are growing rapidly. Uh, if you look at their, the quality of the products they're producing now compared to just five years ago, it's, it's, they've come on leaps and bounds. So I think it's a, it's a constantly changing landscape. And I think it's one that as buyers, we have to we have to remain vigilant to and, and focused on and, and try and stay current to. I think it always moves around and you have to, you can't get complacent. You always have to evaluate it. You know, there was, when NAFTA started, there was Mexico was super hot and then it moved to China. And I think I agree with Stuart. It seems to be moving heavily to India now. Um, it's always moving somewhere. There's always a new right. spot, you know, Exactly. Okay. So that's, you guys gave me both a, a perfect transition. Let's talk about the BRICS of which obviously I, the I in BRICS is India. Um, and I'm curious, you know, Stuart, let's start with you. Do you think India becomes not only the quality producer that you're talking about, but also what China's kind of famous for? And I know in the steel industry talks about whack-a-mole, you know, does India take on some of the production you know, does, do Chinese start investing in India in order to transship or what's the, what, what are your, what's your take on that in terms of India's role um, with, with the BRICS specifically? I can see India becoming a leading country within, within the, the BRICS. Um, I think Russia's role is, is much reduced because of their prior state status. I think Brazil uh, will be, always be an important source of commodities within the BRICS because of its, its huge resources, but it's a high cost producer. Uh, but I think India does have the opportunity to be something more, but I don't think it'll ever be much of an entreport for Chinese material. There's almost more antagonism between China and India than there is between the US and, and China, if you, if you can believe it. They actually have a, a hot a hot war going on at their border intermittently. And I think uh, they see themselves as rivals. So um, I don't see China as uh, India as becoming uh, an entrepreneur, but I see it. I, I think they see themselves as potential competitors uh, and, and are therefore supportive of, of the, many of these industries, which can become play a bigger role on the, on the world stage, such as steel, aluminum, zinc, et cetera, et cetera. 
you know, there's think, been a lot of I think they have the willingness too. So they don't seem to want to wade into some of the geopolitical stuff that everybody else is. They're really it, it seems like they take a little more neutral take on it. Like they just want what's best for their country and they don't care so much what you do to everything else. I think that it brings up some interesting issues with the BRICS. I know we've written about it a lot, and there's a lot of macroeconomic speakers, economists talking about whether or not, you know, the loss of the U.S. dollar hegemony and, you know, this alternative currency. And a lot of what we've read is I think you guys both hit on some of that conflict between India and China and the likelihood of for example, the BRICS being able to agree on an alternative currency is not in the near-term cards for sure. And but the notion of you know creating up these creating these different trading blocks is interesting. But it, I I think India is an is like a turkey in that it's kind of east meets east meets west. Um, and I, I think in, it sounds like India kind of serves as that supplier. But I don't want to. Um, get too sidetracked from from what we were discussing. So let's kind of get on to the next topic. Um, Don, I'm wondering if you can walk us through any stories from the field. For those of you that don't know, Don came from John Deere. Um, so he did a lot of the steel buying there. I'm sure in your years there or prior to you being there, you may have heard of shortages or price volatility. Um, Anything you can share, you know, with the audience in terms of what works, doesn't work, et cetera, would be helpful. Uh, sure. So I was kind of fortunate. I had a relatively easy stint. Um, we could kind of always get steel. The volatility was there, but um, supply was was always there. But I, I worked closely with, there was a lot of experience there. Um, some of the, the people that had been through it before like most times in the steel industry anyway, they leaned on relationships uh, and it's kind of a, a give and go. Um, they would tell, tell a story that, you know, steel dipped down to like four, 400 a ton or something, which is really low. Uh, at the time they had a pretty good contract and, and they went back to a, a certain mill and said, Hey, we know you're underwater. Steel's at a good price. We'll give you back some of this discount really. And then and then the flip side, because it's it's always up and down, there's always a cycle. There was a time not long after that, you know, steel started coming up quickly. Supply was short, and they were able to to get that supply because of that relationship. Now, I'm I'm not saying you know, go out and give away money that you don't have to, but kind of is what I'm trying to get at is relationships are are paramount in shortages. We don't really have that right now, but we will. Again, there will be a time where you need steel and can't get it. And if you're a good customer and you've been a good customer and you've built those relationships, you'll get your material. And if you're opportunistic and try to squeeze out every dime, you're going to wait for your material. Uh, I think that's really important in supply shocks and shortages of material to remember you need at least a couple suppliers that you've been good to even when you didn't have to. Right. I think that's a great point, Don, actually. I mean, we've only got to cast your mind back 12 to 18 months ago when there were real supply shortages in, in, in uh, the US and in Europe. But those supplier relationships that, that you could count on, that you could rely on, was often what kept the production line running. Yeah. yeah. It, I mean, you don't, not everybody needs to be that way, and you can't be that way with all of your suppliers. Some of them are going to gouge you on the way up, and you have to go get it on the way back down, all of it. Uh, but you have to have some suppliers that you have a more partnership type relationship. Um, they can't all be transactional or you're going to hurt. Totally. Um, by the way, we've done some of the polling on LinkedIn and we're hearing that people st are still having shortage issues, even within the metal space, which might surprise all of us here. But it is happening. So the shortages that seem to be like an ongoing narrative and we're never at a time, we have yet to come to a time where, you know, we have sort of like a small minority of our, you know, readership or audience that says it's a non-issue. So somebody's always looking for, um, I find that phenomenon in and of itself a little bit interesting. Don, I'm also curious from, you know, and I know you've got amazing steel buying experience, but what what kind of like strategies and tactics would you take 
um, at deer, if you were in sort of like, you looked at the forecast and you knew that like your forecast was not as strong as it, I mean, obviously all those years you worked there, you didn't have like great demand every single year all the time. But if you saw that it was lowering or slowing, what any, any tips or tricks of the trade that you can offer up to the audience about how you manage that? Yeah, I think it's your forecast transparency. And it doesn't matter if you're a huge buyer or small buyer. I think that transparency always helps. And I'm talking about your demand. So what is what are your orders looking like when you try to marry up your your contract? You're you're ultimately trying to marry that up with your own internal demand. And if that falls off quickly uh, and you're still on the hook for this big chunk of material that you don't need, it puts you in a bad spot and it kind of makes you a bad customer too you know going back to the relationship part but if you're really transparent hey these are the orders that i had when we negotiated this contract and you're you really keep keep open with that with your supplier hey they fell off this quarter they fell off this quarter they fell off this month uh, a lot of times they'll give you a little more flexibility usually your contract you know plus or minus some number 10 15 percent something like that if you're really transparent and you show them hey i'm not playing the market. I'm not doing anything um, strange here to take advantage of anything. It's just, this is what my demand is. And it's fallen off. A lot of times you, you get more wiggle room than, than what's in the contract. That's great. Stuart, uh, anything to add to that? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, th I think no, I, I, it's a great point that Don makes. I, I think we all tend to hold our cards a little close to our chest sometimes, and it, uh, it's difficult to to trust your suppliers but it's part of that relationship uh, issue that don was touching on earlier and there's and there's no doubt about it if you're in a sales role and your customer is more transparent and open with you you're willing to trust them you're willing to give them a little more latitude a little more flexibility than if you feel that possibly they're gaming you transparency uh, is important it's an open dialogue Great. Um, Don, I want to come back to, um, again, we're approaching our annual contract negotiations. A lot of companies are doing that now. Some, you know, do it during Q1. Um, but could you just kind of talk through sort of the seasonal patterns of steel prices and how you kind of look at them? Because that is such a big chunk of a lot of our, you know, a lot of attendees, their spend, et cetera. Just curious to get your thoughts on that. And I just want to remind everybody uh, that's listening in, feel free to throw your questions in the chat box. I know it's we've kind of gone pretty far through already, but feel free to do that. Um, so Donna, any thoughts on that? Or if you look back historically, there's a seasonality to the steel market, the steel prices, um, not every year, but most years it gets soft towards the end. If you think about you have Thanksgiving and Christmas, you have those shutdowns, production kind of gears back and then the big um, publicly traded service centers or other companies are trying to skinny down their inventory to get some of that off their books for their financials for that you know for the end of the year so you usually get a little softness in the in the market but then it usually gets turned back on at the beginning of the year too you're ramping back up your production and there's restocking so you get a little bit of that of that spike uh, it's important to not get scared when that spike comes to sometimes you get some of that emotional buying uh, that'll be you know the increases are coming out it's up 25 it's up 50 you know all those those kind of tactics uh, that then a lot of times drives a spike after the beginning of the year um, don't get panicked into thinking no that's going back to a thousand dollars a ton again it's not uh, well i don't think it is but um you know, it's important to kind of keep your head and in, in, in level loaded, kind of go with your with your strategy there too. And as that softness comes at the end of the year, there's a little bit of that, how long do I wait? Uh, is it soft enough? Do I kind of try to execute some contract now? Uh, you don't want to wait too long or you lose some of that. You go into the last couple of weeks of December and you, you, sometimes you get stuck with whatever you get then. Right. No, these are all good points. And I know there's so many different dynamics going on right now. Most of the markets are kind of soft for us at the moment, but we also know that at a moment's notice, something can go skyrocketing. Um, I just wanted to share with our uh, readers here and, and attendees, just some free resources that are on the Metal Miner website as we wrap up. 
we have a free weekly newsletter. It comes out Wednesday mornings. It's a great way to kind of take the pulse on, you know, break, not breaking news, but breaking news that could have an impact on metal prices. And we try to do that, um, you know, every Wednesday and come up with fresh ideas, et cetera. Obviously, our the piece that's not free, it's free to check out our in Metal Miner Insights platform. That is our SaaS platform. Um, we've got a new article per day that's available on the website under content, a free monthly MMI report, which is essentially like an insurance, not insurance, an inflation um, adjuster by Metal Market Basket. And then a number of kind of a, a lot of the concepts we've talked about today are available in our resource library and just want to make everyone aware that those are available to you. And with that, I'm going to return you all to your day. I appreciate your time that you've spent with us. If there's anything that we can do for you or help with, uh, feel free to reach out to any of us here on LinkedIn. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Bye-bye.